Hello and welcome to Mrs. Pam Reigns. <laughs> Today we will be continuing in, oh, got a full table here, in the help. The light will shift in a minute. By Catherine Stockett. Sorry, distracted. We will be in chapter 19, oh, which is entitled um, Miss Skeeter. So we'll be hearing things from Miss Skeeter's point of view. Chapter 19 is very long. It's 20 pages, but we'll split it up just into uh, two. So we'll do about 10 pages each video. In chapter 18, we were finishing up Minnie's point of view. And we learned that Miss Celia had a miscarriage, but thankfully Minnie was there to help her. All right, so now Miss Skeeter. Ah, we've changed years. It is 1963, the space age they're calling it. A man has circled the earth in a rocket ship. They've invented a pill oh. so married women don't have to get pregnant. A can of beer opens with a single finger instead of a can opener. Yet my parents' house is still as hot as it was in 1899, the year great-grandfather built it. Mama, please, I beg, when are we going to get air conditioning? We have survived this long without electric cool, and I have no intentions of setting one of those tacky contraptions in my window. And so, as July wanes on, I am forced from my attic bedroom to a cot on the screened back porch. When we were kids, Constantine used to sleep out here with Carlton and me in the summer when Mama and Daddy went to out-of-town weddings. Constantine slept in an old-fashioned white nightgown up to her chin and down to her toes, even though it'd be as hot as Hades. She used to sing to us so we'd go to sleep. Her voice was so beautiful, I couldn't understand how she'd never had lessons. Mother had always told me a person can't learn anything without proper lessons. It's just unreal to me that she was here, right here on the porch, and now she's not. And no one will tell me a thing. I wonder if I'll ever get to see her again. Next to my cot, now, my typewriter sits on a rusted white enamel wash table. Underneath is my red satchel. I take daddy's hanky and wipe my forehead, press salted ice to my wrists. Even on the back porch, the Avery Lumber Company temperature dial rises from 89 to 96 to a nice round 100 degrees. Luckily, Stuart doesn't come over during the day when the heat is at its worst. I stare at my typewriter with nothing to do, nothing to write. Minnie's stories are finished and typed already. It's a wretched feeling. Two weeks ago, Abilene told me that Yule May, Billy's maid, might help us that she shows a little more interest every time Abilene talks to her. But with Medgar Evers' murder and colored people getting arrested and beat up by the police, I'm sure she's scared to death by now. Maybe I ought to go over to Hilly's and ask Yule May myself. But no, Abilene's right. I'd probably scare her even more and ruin any chance we have. Under the house, the dog yawns, whine in the heat. One lets out, oh, the dog's plural. One lets out a half-hearted woof as daddy's field workers, five Negroes, pull up in a truck bed. 
The men jump from the tailgate, hoofing up dust when they hit the dirt. They stand a moment, dead-faced, stupefied. The foreman drags a red cloth across his black forehead, his lips, his neck. It's so recklessly hot, I don't know how they can stand baking out there in the sun. In a rare breeze, my copy of Life magazine flutters. Audrey Hepburn smiles on the cover, no sweat beating on her upper lip. I pick it up and finger the wrinkled pages, flip to the story on the Soviet space girl. I already know what's on the next page. Behind her face is a picture of Carl Roberts, a colored school teacher from Pelahatchie, 40 miles from here. In April, Carl Roberts told Washington reporters what it means to be a black man in Mississippi, calling the governor a pathetic man with the morals of a streetwalker. Ro Roberts was, oh, Roberts was found cattle branded and hung from a pecan tree. They'd killed Carl Roberts for speaking out, for talking. I think about how easy I thought it would be three months ago to get a dozen maids to talk to me. Like they'd just been waiting all this time to spill their stories to a white woman. How stupid I'd been. When I can't take the heat another second, I go sit in the one cool place on Longleaf. I turn on the ignition and roll up the windows pull my dress up around my underwear and let the bi-level blow on me full blast. As I lean my head back, the world drifts away, tinged by the smell of Freon and Cadillac leather. I hear a truck pull up into the front drive, but I don't open my eyes. A second later, my passenger door opens. Damn, it feels good in here. I push my dress down. What are you doing here? Stuart shuts the door, kisses me quickly on the lips. I only have a minute. I have to head down to the coast for a meeting. For how long? Three days. I've got to catch some fella on the Mississippi Oil and Gas Board. I wish I'd known about it sooner. He reaches out and takes my hand and I smile. We've been going out twice a week for two months now. If you don't count the horror date, I guess that's considered a short time to other girls, but it's the longest thing that's ever happened to me. And right now it feels like the best. Wanna come, he says, to Biloxi? Right now? Right now, he says and puts his cool palm on my leg. As always, I jump a little. I look down at his hand, then up to make sure mother's not spying on us. Come on, it's too damn hot here. I'm staying at the Edgewater right on the beach. I laugh, and it feels good after all the worrying I've done these past weeks. You mean at the Edgewater? Together? In the same room? He nods. Think you can get away? Elizabeth would be mortified by the thought of sharing a room with a man before she was married. Hilly would tell me I was stupid to even consider it. They'd held on to their virginity with the fierceness of children refusing to share their toys. And yet, I consider it. Stuart moves closer to me. He smells like pine trees and fired tobacco, expensive soap, the likes of which my family's never known. Mama'd have a fit, Stuart. Plus, I have all this other stuff to do. But God, he smells good. He looks at me like he wants to eat me up, and I shiver under the blast of Cadillac air. You sure, he whispers, and he kisses me then on the mouth not so politely as before. 
His hand is still on the upper quarter of my thigh, and I find myself wondering again if he was like this with his fiancée, Patricia. I don't even know if they went to bed together. The thought of them touching makes me feel sick, and I pull back from him. I just, I can't, I say. You know, I couldn't tell Mama the truth. He lets out a long, sorry sigh, and I love that look on his face, that disappointment. I understand now why girls resist, just for that sweet look of regret. Don't lie to her, he says. You know I hate lies. Will you call me from the hotel? I ask. I will, he says. I'm sorry I have to leave so soon. Oh, and I almost forgot. In three weeks, Saturday night, mother and daddy want y'all to come have supper. I sit up straighter. Never met his parents before. What do you mean, y'all? You and your parents. Come into town. Meet my family. But why all of us? He shrugs. My parents want to meet them. And I want them to meet you. But I'm sorry, baby, he says. He pushes my hair behind my ear. I have to go. Call you tomorrow night? I nod. He climbs out into the heat and drives off, waving to Daddy, walking up the dusty lane. I'm left alone in the Cadillac to worry. Supper at the state senator's house, with Mother there asking a thousand questions, looking desperate on my behalf, bringing up cotton trust funds. Three excruciatingly long, hot nights later, with still no word from Yule May or any of the other maids, Stuart comes over straight from his meeting on the coast. I'm sick of sitting at the typewriter, typing nothing, but newsletters and Miss Myrna. I run down the steps and he hugs me like it's been weeks. Stuart's unsunburned, no, sunburned. Stuart's sunburned beneath his white shirt. The back wrinkled from driving, the sleeves rolled up. He wears a perpetual, almost devilish smile. We both sit straight up on opposite sides of the relaxing room, staring at each other. We're waiting for mother to go to bed. Daddy went to sleep when the sun went down. Stuart's eyes hang on mine while mother waxes on about the heat, how Carlton's finally met the one. And we're thrilled about dining with your parents, Stuart. Please do tell your mother I said so. Yes, ma'am, I sure will. He smiles over at me again. There are so many things I love about him. He looks me straight in the eye when we talk. His palms are calloused, but his nails are clean and trimmed. I love the rough feeling on my neck. And I'd be lying if I didn't admit that it's nice to have someone to go to weddings and parties with. Not to have to endure the look in Raleigh Leifold's eyes when he sees that I'm tagging along again. The sullen days when he has to carry my coat with Elizabeth, fetch me a drink too. Then there is Stuart at the house. From the minute he walks in, I am protected, exempt. Mother won't criticize me in front of him for fear he might notice my flaws himself. She won't nag me in front of him because she knows that I'd act badly and whine. <laughs> Short my chances. It's all a big game to mother to show only one side of me that the real me shouldn't come out until after it's too late. Finally, at half past nine, mother smooths her skirt, folds a blanket slowly and perfectly, like a cherished letter. <clears throat> well, I guess it's time for bed. I'll let you young people alone. Eugenia, she eyes me, not too late now. I smile sweetly. I am 23 years old. 
Of course not, Mama. She leaves and we sit, staring, smiling, waiting. Mother pads around the kitchen, closes a window, runs some water. A few seconds pass and we hear the clack click of her bedroom door shutting. Stuart stands and says, come here. <laughs> and he's on my side of the room in one stride. And he claps my hands to his, my hands to his hips and kisses my mouth like I am the drink he's been dying for all day. And I've heard girls say, it's like melting. That feeling, but I think it's like rising, growing even taller and seeing sights over a hedge, colors you've never seen before. I have to make myself pull away. I have things to say. Come here, sit down. We sit by side by side on the sofa. He tries to kiss me again, but I back my head away. I try not to look at the way his sunburn makes his eyes so blue or the way the hairs on his arms are golden, bleached. Stuart, I swallow ready myself for the dreaded question. When we're engaged, were your parents disappointed when whatever happened with Patricia happened? Immediately, a stiffness forms around his mouth. He eyes me. Mother was disappointed. They were close. Already, I regret having brought it up but I have to know, how close? He glances around the room. Do you have anything in the house? Bourbon? I go to the kitchen and pour him a glass from Pascagoula's cooking bottle. Top it off with plenty of water. Stuart made it clear the first time he showed up on my porch, his fiance was a bad subject. But I need to know what this thing was that happened not just because I'm curious. I've never been in a relationship. I need to know what constitutes breaking up forever. I need to know how many rules you can break before you're thrown out and what those rules even are in the first place. So they were good friends, I asked. I'll be meeting his mother in two weeks. Mother's already set on our shopping trip to Kensington's tomorrow. He takes a long drink, frowns. They'd get in a room and swap notes on flower arrangements and who married who. All traces of his mischievous smile are gone now. Mother was pretty shook up after it fell apart. So... She'll be comparing me to Patricia. Stuart blinks at me a second. Probably. Great. I can hardly wait. Mother's just protective is all. She's worried I'll get hurt again. He looks off. Where is Patricia now? Does she still live here or no? She's gone. Moved to California. Can we talk about something else now? I sigh, fall back against the sofa. Well, <clears throat> do your parents at least know what happened? I mean, am I allowed to know that? Because I feel a flash of anger that he won't tell me something as important as this. Skeeter, I told you, I hate talking. But then he grits his teeth, lowers his voice. Dad only knows part of it. Mother knows the real story. So do Patricia's parents, and of course, her. He throws back the rest of the drink. She knows what she did, that's for sure. Stuart, I only want to know so I don't do the same thing. He looks at me and tries to laugh, but it comes out more like a growl. You would never in a million years do what she did. What? What did she do? Skeeter, he sighs and sets his glass down. I'm tired. I better just go on home.
<clears throat> I walk into the steamy kitchen the next morning, dreading the day ahead. Mother is in her room getting ready for our shopping trip to outfit us both for supper at the Whitworths. I have on blue jeans and an untucked blouse. Morning, Pascagoula. Morning, Miss Skeeter. You want your regular breakfast? Yes, please, I say. Pascagoula is small and quick on her feet. I told her last June how I liked my coffee black and toast barely buttered, and she never had to ask again. She's like Constantine that way, never forgetting things for us. It makes me wonder how many white women's breakfasts she has ingrained in her brain. I wonder how it would feel to spend your whole life trying to remember other people's preferences on to toast, butter, and starch amounts and sheet changings. She sets my coffee down in front of me. She doesn't hand it to me. Abilene told me that's not how it's done because then your hands might touch. I don't remember how Constantine used to do it. Thank you, I say, very much. She blinks at me a second, smiles weakly. You, welcome. I realize this is the first time I've ever thanked her sincerely. She looks uncomfortable. Skeeter, you ready? I hear mother call from the back. I holler that I am. I eat my toast and hope we get this shopping trip over quickly. I am 10 years too old to have my mother still picking out clothes for me. I look over and notice Pascagoula watching me from the sink. She turns away when I look at her. I skim the Jackson Journal sitting on the table. My next Miss Myrna column won't come out until next Monday. Unlocking the mystery of hard water stains. Down in the national news section, there's an article on a new pill. The Valium, they're calling it. To help women cope with everyday challenges. God, I could use about 10 of those little pills right now. I look up and am surprised to see Pascagoula standing right next to me. Are you, do you need something, Pascagoula? I ask. I need to tell you something, Miss Eater. Something about that. You cannot wear dungarees to Kensington's, Mother says from the doorway. Like vapor, Pascagoula disappears from my side. She's back at the sink, stretching a black rubber hose from the faucet to the dishwasher. You go upstairs and put on something appropriate. Mother, this is what I'm wearing. What's the point of getting dressed up to buy new clothes? Eugenia, please, let's don't make this any harder than it is. Mother goes back to her bedroom, but I know this isn't the end of it. The whoosh of the dishwasher fills the room. The floor vibrates under my bare feet and the rumbling is smoothing loud enough to cover a conversation, I watch Pascagoula at the sink. Did you need to tell me something, Pascagoula? I ask. Pascagoula glances at the door. She's just a slip of a person, practically half of me. Her manner is so timid. I lower my head when I talk to her. She comes a little closer. You'll may my cousin. Pascagoula says over the whir of the machine. She's whispering, but there's nothing timid about her tone now. I didn't know that. We close kin, and she come out to my house ever other weekend to check on me. She told me what it is you doing. She narrows her eyes, and I think she's about to tell me to leave her cousin alone. I, we're changing the names. She told you that, right? I don't want anybody to get in trouble. She tell me Saturday she gone help. She tried to call Abilene, but couldn't get her. Ida told you earlier, but again, she glances at the doorway. 
I am stunned. She is? She will? I stand up. Despite my better thinking, I can't help but ask. Pascabula, do you want to help with the stories too? She gives me a long, steady look. You mean tell you what it's like to work for your mama? We look at each other, probably thinking the same thing. The discomfort of her telling, the discomfort of me listening. Not my mother, I say quickly. Other jobs, ones you've had before this. This is my first job working domestic. I used to work at the old lady home serving lunch before it moved out to Fleetwood. You mean mother didn't mind this being your first house job? Pascagoula looks at the red linoleum floor, timid again. Nobody else will work for her, she says, not after what happened with Constantine. I place my hand carefully on the table. What did you think about that? Pascagoula's face turns blank. She blinks a few times, clearly outsmarting me. I don't know nothing about it. I just wanted to tell you what you may say. She goes to the refrigerator, opens it, and leans inside. I let out a long, deep breath. One thing at a time. Shopping with mother isn't as unbearable as usual. Probably because I'm in such a good mood from hearing about Yule May. Mother sits in a chair in the dressing lounge and I choose the first lady day suit I try on. Light blue poplin with a round collar jacket. We leave it at the store so they can take down the hem. I'm surprised when mother doesn't try on anything. After only half an hour, she says she's tired. So I drive us back to Longleaf. Mother goes straight to her room to nap. When we get home, I call Elizabeth's house, my heart pounding, but Elizabeth picks up the phone. I don't have the nerve to ask for Abilene. After the satchel scare, I promised myself I'd be more careful. So I wait until that night, hoping Abilene's home. I sit on my can of flour, fingers working a bag of dry rice. She answers the first ring. She'll help us, Abilene. You may said yes. Say what? When you find out. This afternoon, Pascagoula told me, you may couldn't reach you. La, my phone was disconnected because I was short this month. You talk to you, may? No, I thought it would be better if you talked to her first. What's strange is I call over to Miss Hilly House this afternoon from Miss Leifold's, but she say you may don't work there no more and hang up. I've been asking around, but nobody know a thing. Hilly fired her? I don't know. I was hoping maybe she quit. I'll call Hilly and find out. God, I hope she's all right. And now that my phone's back on, I keep trying to call you May. I call Hilly's house four times, but the phone just rings. Finally, I call Elizabeth and she tells me Hilly's gone to Port Gibson for the night, that William's father is ill. Did something happen with her maid? I ask as casually as I can. You know, she mentioned something about Yul May, but then she said she was late and had to pack up the car. I spend the rest of the night on the back porch rehearsing questions, nervous about what stories Yul May might tell about Hilly. Despite our disagreements, Hilly is still one of my closest friends. But the book, now that is going again, is more important than anything. I lay on the cot at midnight. The crickets sing outside the screen. I let my body sink deep into the thin mattress against the springs. My feet dangle off the end. 
danced nervously, relishing relief for the first time in months. It's not a dozen maids, but it's one more. The next day, I'm sitting in front of the television set, watching the 12 o'clock news. Charles Waring is reporting, telling me that 60 American soldiers have been killed in Vietnam. It's so sad to me, 60 men in a place far away from anyone they loved had to die. I think it's because of Stuart that this bothers me so. But Charles Waring looks eerily, eerily thrilled by it all. I pick up a cigarette and put it back down. I'm trying not to smoke, but I'm nervous about tonight. Mother's been nagging me about my smoking, and I know I should stop, but it's not like it's going to kill me. 1963. <laughs> I wish I could ask Pascagoula more about what Yule May said, but Pascagoula called this morning and said she had a problem and wouldn't be coming in until this afternoon. I can hear mother out on the back porch helping Jameso make ice cream. Even in the front of the house, I can hear the rumbling noise of ice cracking and salt crunching. The sound is delicious makes me wish for some now, but it won't be ready for hours. Of course, no one makes ice cream at 12 noon on a hot day. It's a night chore, but mother has it in her mind that she's going to make, make peach ice cream and the heat be damned. I go out to the back porch and look. The big silver ice cream maker is cold and sweaty. The back porch floor vibrates. Jameso's sitting on an upside down bucket, knees on either side of the machine, turning the wooden crank with gloved hands. Steam rises from the well of dry ice. Has Pascagoula come in yet? Mama asks, feeding more cream into the machine. Not yet, I say. Mother is sweating. She pushes a loose strand of hair behind her ear. I'll pour the cream a while, Mama. You look hot. You won't do it right. I have to do it, she says, and shoes me back inside. On the news, now Roger Sticker is reporting in front of the Jackson Post Office with the same stupid grin as the war reporter. This Modern postal addressing system is called a, now it's spelled ZZ, so I don't know, but it's zip code. <laughs> That's right, I said zip code. That's five numbers to be written along the bottom of your envelope. He's holding up a letter showing us where to write the numbers. A man in overalls with no teeth says, ain't nobody gonna use them their numbers. Folks is still trying to get used to using the telephone. I hear the front door close. A minute passes and Pascagoula comes in the relaxing room. Mother's out on the back porch, I tell her, but Pascagoula doesn't smile, doesn't even look at me. She just hands me a small envelope. She was gonna mail it, but I told her I'd just carry it to you. Front of the envelope is addressed to me. No return name on it. Certainly no zip code. Pascagoula walks off toward the back porch. I open the letter. The handwriting is in black pen, written on the straight blue lines of school paper. And now you're gonna have to wait to see what happens because we're halfway through the chapter. <laughs> All right, you guys. I hope that you have a wonderful day. Woo, I'm going to have to get a drink. I hope that y'all have a wonderful day. I will see you for the rest of the chapter next time.